Hi uh, guys, uh, it's Dean again. Uh, we're going to look at the third ex uh, part of our Earth Thought Loop Impedance session, um, session three. Uh, previously we've looked at the Earth Fault Loop Impedance Loop and we looked at how the impedance of the loop um, is proportional to the current, uh, the fault current flow and how that affects the disconnection time. What we're going to do uh, next is we're going to have a look at the R1, R2 values. So we're going to actually calculate R1, R2 um, and we're going to determine uh, the disconnection time from some installation data. So previously when we've looked at earth fault loop impedance we've written the formula down as ZE plus R1 plus R2. Uh, what we're going to do this time is we're going to add a couple of temperature correction factors. Now the reason we do that is um, the values that we can get for R1 R2 out of the wire regulations uh, and I'll show you a copy of them here. So this is table 9A. It's a bit of a bad scan. I do apologise. Uh, this is taken from the IET on-site guide. Uh, it's table 9A. And you can see there that for a 2.5mm cable on its own here, it has a resistance per metre of 7.41 milliohms. Okay. But that's at 20 degrees C. So... What happens if our installation isn't running at 20 degrees C uh, or our circuits is loaded up? Uh, in other words, it's carrying quite a heavy current normally. The conductors can operate up to 70 degrees C. So for that reason, we can add some temperature factors. So now we're going to write in our new formula, which is exactly the same as before, except now we'll put our R1, R2 in there. and That pen's playing up a little bit. And then we have a factor times the factors here. And that's what we're going to look at next in the next example. So this is table 9A of the on-site guide. And you can see on this left hand column here, we have our line conductor, our R1. So we've got a 1 mil on its own. Per meter is 18.1 uh, uh, milliohms per meter. Uh, and then we have uh, a protective conductor. So we've got our R1 and our R2. So obviously that's double. Uh, and it goes all the way down up to about 50 mil. Uh, obviously I've only got down to 10 because of my screen clip. The next uh, table, table 9B in the on-site guide, which is over the next page, what we have here is if the cables are installed, the ambient temperature, so the temperature that's surrounding the cables, um, then you can see there that they are based at 20 degrees. So if you were operating at a higher so a higher temperature, so up to 30 degrees, you can see it goes at 1, 0, 1 1.02, 1 1.04, etc. Yeah. So if it's installed outdoors, so outside in a nice cool place, then you could probably derate the cable 0.98. So obviously that basically means that the resistance will be less. Um, whereas obviously if the ambient temperature is higher, then the resistance of the cable will increase. And the final adjustment factor table is this one. Now, normally, our installation cables at 20 degrees, so room temperature, will have a resistance of whatever we've got here on this column. So, for example, a 2.5 mil cable, 2.5 mil R1, 1.5 R2, will have a resistance of 19.51 milliohms per metre at 20 degrees. But that a PVC cable can operate up to 70 degrees so that's going to affect its conductor resistance so as electric current flows through the cable what that will do is that will cause the resistance of the cable to increase pretty much so for that reason what we can do during fault conditions is we can actually well not fault conditions during normal operating conditions we can actually lift that value of resistance by using these factors here so the most common cable uh, would be a 70 degrees C so if it's incorporated in a cable so if it's a multi-core uh, or it's bunched in a conduit then normally the factor would be 1.2 so that changes the operating resistance from uh, 20 degrees to 70 if it's not incorporated in a bunch of so it's just singles that are kind of clipped apart or you know well spaced then obviously we get um, a lower factor so let's look now at um, a little bit of a uh, 
example. So we've got a final circuit, which is wired in 1.5 mil uh, PVC singles. So it's going to be in a conduit. Uh, and the approximate length of run is about 30 meters. Now the external impedance is given as 0.45 ohms. The circuit is protected by a 16 amp type C, so motor rated uh, BSEN60898 circuit breaker. And the ambient temperature is 25 degrees C. Uh, we're going to calculate the impedance and we're going to determine the protective device disconnection time. So if we look here, we've got, there's our impedance there. So that's our, our basic impedance, but this time we're going to add a little bit more accuracy to our R1, R2 because this doesn't really give into account any of the, that that would be for 20 degrees. Um, what we're going to do is, is we're going to put some factors in here. So to work the R1, R2 out, it's the milliohms per meter of the cable. So that would be from table 9A of the on-site guide. Uh, the length, obviously, which we know in the brief gives us as 30 metres. Uh, and the factors we need to pick for 9B and 9C. So, our earth fault external impedance is 0.45 ohms. And our R1, R2, well, it's a 1.5 cable. So, if I go back to my slides here, you can see that a 1.5, I'm going to highlight this for you. A 1.5, 1.5 has a resistance of 24.2 uh, milliohms per meter. So we'll drop that in there. So 24.2 times 10 to the minus 3 ohms. I've just comforted a bit of standard form. Uh, and then the other factors then, let's look at the other factors from these tables to be for our accuracy. Well, the ambient temperature of the brief gave it a 25 degrees. So we're going to put in there one of the factors we're going to be want we times it's a D rating factor, so we multiply it by 1.02. That increases the resistance ever so slightly. And also, if we go onto here, you can see that the cables are PVC because they're singles and they're going to be bunched in a conduit. So their factor is going to be 1.2. So we work all that out there in the brackets, and you can see that the actual R1, R2 value would be 9.89 so you, so this also demonstrates uh, how you install a particular cable in temperatures and so on and size really does have an impact on the actual impedance or r1 r2 should i say so rule is keep your cables nice and cool when you're installing them try not to bunch them together uh, if they run cool then generally we can have more room for maneuvering with our currents and so on Right, so that's our ZS, 1.34. So now we need to work out our fault current. So again, bit of Ohm's law. I've done a little sketch here of our circuit. So we have a ZE of 0.45, which we're given, uh, and our R1, R2 is 0.89 that runs through here like so. So the next thing to look at is the actual fuse, the protective device. Uh, and again, the brief tells us that it's a 16 amp type C, 60898. So I've gone through our regulations um, and I've found this table here. Um, and you can see we're using a type C, 60898. So the first thing we do is, is we look at the 16 amp curve because the circuit is protected by a 16 amp curve. And looking over here on this graph, or sorry, on this table, you can see that a 16 amp protective device needs a minimum fault current of 160 amps for it to go within 0.1 to 5 seconds, which is quite a range. Yeah, okay. Well, ours is 171 amps because we just worked that out previously down here on our fault current. And I've kind of drawn a line there, that red line. And like we said earlier in the previous uh, two lessons, that if the fault current is greater than the minimum on here, then it would be an instant disconnection. So what that means is it means that the disconnection time would be less than 0.1 seconds. Now, just one other thing that I'd like to talk about with these curves is if you look at the difference between them, you can see that on the Type-C circuit breaker, um, we have this nice curve 
and then we hit a straight line. Well, that's because the circuit breakers are uh, mechanical and the actual curve is the thermal trip of the device. So this is the overload facility. So if we look at that six amp uh, circuit breaker, for example, let's just pick an easy line here. So if I was to go here, then we're going to be at 30 amps. That circuit breaker, the six amp circuit breaker would trip at around about, let's call that 15 seconds, yeah? Now these type C circuit breakers are used for motor overload or inductive loads like for fluorescent lighting, discharge lighting, that kind of thing, where you would get an inrush current. And that's what this is allowing. So this gives us a nice allowance for an inrush. But when we get to this straight line here, that straight line is the is the magnetic operation of the protected device. So when we get to a certain value, and it's actually these values here, so a 6 amp circuit breaker at 60 amps, you can see there, bang, it's straight off. Okay, that is the magnetic part of a circuit breaker. So what I say to, uh, to students is, uh, if you get called to a breakdown and, and a circuit breaker trips uh, and during your fault diagnosis you re-energise a circuit and it trips after, say, a short time, but not instantaneously, it's probably an overload. But if you reset the breaker and you get an almighty flash, uh, which I would do with caution, um, then it suggests that there is a short circuit. Okay. Okay, so on the subject of time current curves, uh, we're going to have a look at the common curves uh, on protective devices that are generally found in households uh, and uh, small current domestic commercial circuits. Starting off with the uh, old school BS3036 semi rewirable, so this is the fuse wire. Still in uh, circulation today. Uh, there's not that many of them. There are a lot of uh, properties, a lot of houses, and a lot of installations have, have, have been upgraded over the years. Uh, but they are still out there and they are still recognised as a British standard protective device if they've got the right size fuse wire in, of course. So you can see, looking at these curves here, that we have nice a nice sweeping bend um, and quite a poor fusing factor. What we mean by a fusing factor is for a 5 amp device to blow quite quickly, it needs quite a high current. So in order for that device to trip in, say, 0.4 seconds, it needs to be about 15 amps. So it's actually quite a poor fusing factor. You can see there the currents are quite high there. So you need 24, 24 amps for a 5 amp. Uh, if we look now to the cartridge fuse a little bit better, okay, uh, 22 amps, so it's coming down a bit more, so the, the curves are not as severe at the bottom. So these are the little cartridge fuses that you'd get in your plugs, uh, your plug tops, uh, but also some distribution boards do use um, cartridge fuses. Not the best fuse, because obviously you've got to get the right size. This is the 88, so these are what you'll find in your, in your mains. So these are high rupturing fuses, um, and these are generally found on high current installations, so industry or your, your intakes for your switch gear and so on, motor controls. Um, and then, let me just move down here. Here we have the circuit breakers. So you can see the big curves, the big curves that are obviously that I've just talked about. So that's the type D. So the type D at 6 amp needs 120 amps, that's a huge amount of fault current, so we want a very low impedance there. So be careful, those of you which go and some people change for nuisance tripping, they'll change a C type to a D type, because a D type's tripping, or a C type's tripping should I say, just make sure that your impedance is the same, because you'll see now that a C, on a C type circuit breaker, a 6 amp device needs a current of 60 amps. Okay, so it's coming down, and finally, uh, our type B a 6 amp device needs a current of 30. Okay, so quick overview of our protective devices there. Um, I hope you found that useful um, and uh, I'm, uh, I hope to uh, speak to you guys again. Okay, take care.